The hospital was secretly performing these procedures on children as young as 11. I will go through the wrong puberty, making permanent changes to me that I do not want. Quote unquote, this gender affirming care could be investigated as child abuse. The most important hormonal process in the development of children into adults is stopped. Doctors are acting like they're God. We were lying to parents. They had said they would no longer provide hormone-related interventions for transgender kids. Did they stop? They did not. They were implanting these drug delivery devices in children as young as 11, 12, 13 years old. A ban on gender-affirming medical care for transgender youth went into effect in Texas today, making it the most populous state to date with such a ban. An estimated 30,000 young people in Texas between the ages of 13 and 17 identify as transgender. The new law revokes the medical licenses of any doctor who provides minors with gender-affirming medical care. 22 states have laws on the books that ban some form of gender-affirming care for transgender minors, meaning they either ban puberty blockers, hormone treatments, or surgeries, or all three. Without getting this medication, I will go through the wrong puberty, making permanent changes to me that I do not want. These are things that are being done to children under the age of 18 that are irreversible, that will cause side effects, complications, and abnormalities that they will have to live with for the entirety of the rest of their life. I have studied the research, and there is no other instance where a medical profession has proceeded with little or no evidence showing whether or not these hormonal treatments are safe long term. And these treatments certainly are not reversible. That's exactly why our guest tonight, Dr. Anton Heim, says he blew the whistle on Texas Children's Hospital. Dr. Heim made major headlines after claiming the hospital was secretly performing these procedures on children as young as 11. In March of 2022, the Texas Attorney General, Ken Paxton, issued an opinion stating that, quote unquote, this gender affirming care could be investigated as child abuse. So in response to that, Texas Children's Hospital, the largest children's hospital in the world, issued a statement publicly, unequivocally stating they were going to shut down their transgender program. And for me, this was a huge relief, but it was very soon after that I found out this was categorically untrue. People would tell me about how they were implanting these puberty blocking devices into 11, 12, 13 year old kids. They told me about how these kids had all these psychiatric issues that were going unmanaged and just being attributed to this one thing. The reason they were hiding this program was because they knew it was controversial. They knew that the people of Texas wouldn't approve of it. Every kid who walks into that clinic is being told that they have to adopt this identity instead of telling these kids that they're perfect the way they are and they can grow up to be something amazing and they're doing it for their own self-righteousness. And once I knew that was happening, it was something that I knew I had to do something about because if people knew I had the ability to make a change or speak up about it and they knew I stayed silent, then you know I could never forgive myself and I don't think future generations would too. Well, Dr. Heim joins us today, and I wanna be very clear about one thing, because I have looked at the documentation that you provided, and it looks to me like you went to painstaking levels to protect the identity of the patients involved. Yeah, so absolutely nothing was disclosed. I mean, it was important for me as a doctor, you have a responsibility to take care of patients. And you go into medicine because you want to do that. You want to protect patients from the diseases that affect them. But you never imagine that you have to protect these patients from the hospitals. And when I knew that the hospital was lying to the public about this program, I have a responsibility to do something about it. I have a responsibility as a surgeon and then as a person. You spoke up because you said the hospital was lying to the public about what they were and were not doing, correct? Yes, sir. In March 2022, they had said they would no longer provide hormone-related interventions for transgender kids because of the legal risks. And that is as unequivocal as it gets. 
did they stop? So they did not. And the reason I, I knew that, because I worked there. You know, in the months following that, people I worked with had told me they were implanting these drug delivery devices in children as young as 11, 12, 13 years old. And, uh, you know, to, to hear that this was still happening after the fact that they said they had stopped was unimaginable. You know, every indication was that this program was shut down. But behind closed doors, they not only continued it, but expanded it into a multidisciplinary clinic. And when I saw that they were having lectures, they were giving the, the directors of a program that supposedly did not exist. They were given the opportunity to speak at the hospital's most prestigious lecture series. They were giving conferences where they were talking about concealing it from the public. And as a doctor, you know, you have a responsibility to the people you take care of. If you're not willing to defend what you're doing to those people in the public eye, then it's very likely you're doing something very, very wrong. Tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah, so what you can see is that they were continuing these procedures after they said they had stopped. And um, what the drug delivery devices are is, uh, you know, small little device, you know, maybe about a centimeter or two centimeters, you know, not, not very big. And you uh, place it into the arm of a patient and it will deliver uh, puberty blockers into their body for a long period of time, delaying, well, preventing the onset of puberty. So the most important hormonal process in the development of children into adults is stopped. So that just doesn't affect like your, your mind. It has huge effects on your mind, but it affects your body in permanent ways. Now, some of the people on this schedule were young as 11 insert a non-biodegradable drug delivery implant, female to male, transgender person. This was in May of 23, uh, 10 a.m., patient age 12, female, specialty services requested, gender dysphoria in pediatric patient, scheduled June 12, 2023, 10.45 a.m., patient age 12, male, starting puberty blockers. This is the evidence that you had, in addition to other things, that this was continuing. What do you make of the fact that these major medical organizations have signed off on this absent studies that show there aren't negative consequences to this long term? You know, I, I think that's probably the most difficult thing for people to understand. You now, you have all these prestigious institutions, all these prestigious hospitals who are signing off on this and endorsing it. But the fact is, it's not based on any evidence. It's not based on any even logical reasoning. It, you know, they can't even define the terms in which they're seeking to intervene on. And this is not medicine. And you believe that the information that you released may have influenced the passing of State Bill 14, which raises the age to 18 for children to be able to receive this. I, I think so, um, yeah. Now, Democratic State Representative Sean Theory voted for the bill and this video of her has gotten 2.3 million views on social media. Take a look. Members, it is out of respect, caring, and friendship for every member of this body that I would like to share my position on this very complex issue. I am making a decision to place the safety and well being of all young people over the comfort of political expediency. It is my core belief and conclusion that we should remain consistent in the premise that children must be given special provisions under the law as they cannot fully appreciate the long-term long -term consequences of their actions. As such, the best practice should be to raise the age to 18 for gender modification. Moving forward with this prudent policy, we should also ensure that vulnerable children and teenagers have quality access to mental health care that is safe and in a safe and in a supportive environment. Only by taking a careful, compassionate, and evidence-based approach to this issue can we guarantee that we are doing what is truly in the best interest of our children. I think what she's saying in essence is these comorbid conditions that exist with the diagnosis should be dealt with in a mental health environment and at least treated and resolved before any kind of treatment 
that's considered gender affirming care be undertaken. I was working in a pediatric gender center for four and a half years, primarily responsible for patient intakes. The center followed this message that transition would solve everything, that it would solve a child's mental health problems. There were very few written protocols or guidelines. One of the providers even said we were flying the plane as we built it. Doctors are acting like they're God when it comes to medically transitioning children. Children could identify themselves as transgender, see a therapist for one visit, see our endocrinologist for one visit, and end up with hormones that would impact and change their bodies for their lifetime. These were identities that were still shifting and changing, but the treatments were irreversible and permanent. I saw a young person who was begging to have their breasts put back on after having surgery. We were encouraged not to make a big deal out of it and definitely not to tell other families. I couldn't continue to be silent on it. The medical harms and trauma that I saw with these teens just took over my life. I was told I could no longer raise concerns or even use the phrase, I have concerns about a patient. I have no trust in this industry medically transitioning minors anymore. Well, Jamie, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. You describe yourself as a queer woman married to a transgender man. Yes. And you're a member of the LGBTQ community, and you went there to do something good, something positive at this clinic in St. Louis. What changed your mind? A number of things. We started to see patients who were experiencing very significant medical harms, being rushed to the emergency room with lacerations requiring stitches, um, we had patients contact us who were begging to have body parts put back on within months of having surgeries. And the thing that kept happening is every time I would raise concerns and ask about the protocols and ask about the guidelines, this is just how the industry works. If a child says they're trans, there's no questioning it. We just say, yep, you're trans, what would you like? You're, you're telling me that a 12 or 13 year old who can't decide which pajamas to wear can come in and say, I've decided that I want to transition. And with no more than a couple of hours or two visits, not even a couple of hours, two visits, they say, okay, start taking this, start doing this, which alters their biochemistry in a way that you can't come back from. Correct. And you say you saw dramatic increases in teenage girls that had no previous history of gender distress, and they suddenly declared themselves transgender and demanded immediate testosterone blockers. Yeah, when I started, um, so I was there for four and a half years. When I started, I maybe would have five to 10 new incoming patients a month. By the time I left, it was close to 50 every single month. And my background is in clinical research, and so I started looking at the data. I wanted to know what the numbers told me. And towards the end of my tenure, 73% of the new patients coming to us were girls who were in their teen years. So in that really vulnerable age of like 13 to 16, where they are just exposed to so many social pressures, and they're so empathetic to what's going on around them too, that they really pick up on what's going on in their peer group. We had clusters where it would be a handful of one whole high school classroom would come in all trans identified. Historically, this typically would be males. Yeah. And you would have a female how often? Oh, very rare. And also the ages were different. So it would, would usually be younger boys who seemed very feminine or had feminine traits to their family and their families would seek care, trying to understand what was going on for, for their young male child. This was never something that would start in adolescence. And these girls were also 
learning on TikTok, Instagram, they would come in and they would almost have the exact same storyline too. Like they learned what to say from a video to explain, oh no, really, I've felt this way from early childhood, but a lot of their parents couldn't remember anything like that. And part of what's going on right now is that if you question this at all, you are immediately called transphobic, you're immediately called homophobic, you're immediately considered a bigot, and it's just not scientific reality.